Good morning. Good morning. Nice to see all of you this morning. Just a few announcements to bring your attention. This week is already a parish newsletter week. So if you have anything that's going on in November, you want all of us to know about it. Get it to Sandy earlier this week than later. Um, and Tuesday, Winnebago Council will be meeting with a, a Zoom option to do that as well. And then Pastor Bill on Wednesday has uh, started his uh, Bible study, The Bible That Jesus Read. And it's the same study on Thursday night at 7 here at Winnebago. And then uh, 7th and 8th grade uh, confirmation in 9th grade is happening. The 7th graders get to meet in person. I have a number of my 8th graders that have been quarantined, so we're going to be doing that by Zoom. And a couple of my 9th graders are quarantined as well, so we're going to be doing that by Zoom. So I'm learning how to do that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, let's see. Then, uh, that's about the majority of our announcements. Any other announcements that need to be brought attention to the congregation? Okay. If not, our worship service today is all printed in our bulletin. We invite you to uh, turn to the order of confession and forgiveness found on page 2. God of mercy, God of grace, we acknowledge that yours is a love which freely gives without any strings attached. Amen. Jesus tells us that those who wish to be his disciples are to place no limits, no conditions on their mercy or their love. Forgiveness without limits. Jesus indicates that when we refuse to forgive those in our debt, we hinder the gift of God's grace and forgiveness from entering our own lives. Touch our hearts with your goodness, we pray, and remind us that forgiveness is one of the most precious gifts that we can offer one another. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We rejoice because of God's great gift of love to the world, Jesus Christ, who came not to condemn the world, but the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. Thanks be to God. We'll have our opening song with Morning Gilded Skies.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Peace, Lord, be with you always. Share the peace with one another. Take some time to call someone and share the peace today. Continue with the key. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the will of being in the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who are offered here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Canticle of praise, glory to God. chapter of Genesis. Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brother said, what if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph saying, your father gave us this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harmony. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when he spoke to him. And then his brothers also wept, and fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, O oh God, God intended it for good, in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The word of the Lord. Yeah. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is found in Paul's letter to the Romans in the 14th chapter. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those weak must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment those who eat. 
For God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgments on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall. And they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike, and all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day observe it in honor of the Lord. Also those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord. And since they give thanks to God, while well, those who abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves. We do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, so they might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or why are you? Why do you despise your brother or sister? For we all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God, so that each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Amen. Thanks be to God. Congregation, please rise. say, I forgive you. And 
when we do that, then we can be good friends again. And then you can go back to being friends and feel good to be with your friends and sit and laugh and talk. That's what Jesus wants us to do. He doesn't like us to have that icky feeling between us or our friends or our mom and dad. One another wants us to forgive. And then we forgive and have that peace and joy once again to be with our friends. Okay? Thanks for your attention. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I still remember my first marriage counseling case as a social worker for Catholic churches. It was a couple named Mary and John who had been married for over 50 years plus. One day, John came home from, for lunch a little late because he had spent too much time having coffee and talking to his friends at the other day. And when John walked through the door, Mary announced to John, that's it, I want a divorce. Now one would think, and since they had already celebrated their 50th anniversary, plus four years since then, and they were both Roman Catholic, which teaches divorce breaks one of the sacraments, that Mary wouldn't want to do this. But she was insistent. So John took Mary along and to the priest. And after some discussion, the priest suggested that they talk to a marriage council from Catholic Territories. So John and Mary became my first council case. They came to my office early in the afternoon. And I didn't have anything else scheduled, so I know that they could give them the time they needed. I started with John. So John, why don't you start? Tell me why you were here. And John shook his head. Well, I came home late for lunch after visiting my friends at the elevator. When I walked in, Mary announced that she wanted a divorce. I've been late for lunch before, but I was only 10 minutes late, so I couldn't figure what the, was the big deal. She was angry and persistent. And we went to the priest, the priest sent us to you. Other than that, I haven't a clue. And I looked at Mary, and I could see that she was doing with one leg crossed over the other, that leg was sing, swinging with serious energy. And I turned my attention to Mary. Okay, Mary, why don't you begin? And Mary said, gladly, I'll start from the beginning. And she did. On the day, on the way to our honeymoon, on the day of the wedding, we stopped at John's brother's house for a short visit. And John's brother offered us a beer and offered congratulations. And John's brother and his wife had been watching the Minnesota Twins game on the television. And John asked Mary if it was okay if they watched the game together, all four of them, and then they would continue on their way to the honeymoon after the game. And Mary smiled and said, sure, that'll be just fine. But on the inside she was saying, are you nuts? This is our wedding day, and we're on our way to our honeymoon. You want us to watch a stupid baseball game? I can't believe the Minnesota Twins are more important to me than me on our wedding day. But she never said a word. John brought her her disappointment until that moment in our office. As the counseling sessions went on, I discovered that on their wedding day, right before Mary was getting ready to walk down the aisle, her mother came in and had a talk with Mary. Now Mary, after you say vows of love and are pronounced Mary to John, you have to remember that John is the head of the household. You have to listen to what he says and get along. And Mary interpreted her mother's conversation to me that she should never disagree with John and just put her feelings aside every time. She wasn't arguing with John. So not once in 50 plus years did Mary share her own feelings with John until she was in my office. She had bound John to each hurt, starting with the wedding day. And she remembered conversations, word for word, from 50, 40, 30 years ago. And John just shrugged his shoulder and said, he did remember such conversation from so long ago. And without forgiveness, where he had no peace. Each hurt from each life, from each conversation just kept burning inside, creating alienation and resentment. And when she finally got the 50 plus years of hurt off her chest, and John had the opportunity to say he was sorry, but he didn't remember most of them, Mary had some peace. She dropped her insistence on getting divorced, and things kind of went back to normal. Well, John tried harder to get home in time for lunch. Forgiveness and reconciliation are an important part of any relationship. 
but especially important in your relationship between your father and Jesus, with your spouse, and your family and friends, and members of the church. And as we listen to Jesus teach, Jesus doesn't want us to be left in that brokenness of sin with all its hurts, just as Mary had suffered silently for 50 plus years. As we listen to Jesus teaching about forgiveness, Jesus declares that forgiveness is the very hallmark characteristic of the kingdom of God. That Jesus came to deliver us out of our sin, our brokenness, our broken relationship with God and with one another. And Jesus forgives us as our risen, crucified Lord. And then Jesus teaches us that as the church, as his ambassadors, we are to bring his love and forgiveness to one another and to the neighbor. Now the last few weeks, we have heard from Jesus that forgiveness and reconciliation is an important part of the kingdom of God. First, Jesus says that one must have the trust in the little child in the kingdom of God. And then Jesus warns about becoming a stumbling block for one of those little ones, leading them into that suffering of the brokenness of sin. And then Jesus warns us about temptations to sin as he gives us a difficult teaching using hyperbole about our hands and eyes being the source of temptation. Jesus taught if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eyes cause you to sin, pluck it out. It's better for you to go through life vain than to go to hell. Well, if we all took Jesus' teaching literally, we would all be blind, missing our hands and our feet. But Jesus uses such hyperbole to get our attention that Jesus and the Father take sin and his brokenness very seriously, and we should as well. And then after Jesus warns us about temptations and fall into them, Jesus tells the parables that assures us that if we fall into sin, Jesus will come and seek us out. Jesus tells the parable about the shepherd and one lost sheep. As the shepherd is calling the sheep into a pen that is made for the evening, he counts the sheep. And when he's one short, the shepherd leaves the 99 and goes searching for that one lost sheep. And he looks behind the bushes, he looks around the stones, he looks at the stream with the run, running water, and he keeps looking until he finds that lost sheep. And once he finds it, he rejoices. And he picks up that sheep with love and carries it home. Jesus will search for us when we become lost, just as the shepherd looks for the lost sheep. And Jesus continues his focus on forgiveness as he lays out this process for forgiveness and reconciliation. First you go to the person, one on one, try to bring about forgiveness and reconciliation. If that doesn't work, you bring two or one or two other people on with you so they can help facilitate that forgiveness. Reconciliation is there to listen, ask questions, clarify, see if they can help the two parties to reconciliation. And if that doesn't work, then we are to bring the person before the whole congregation. Lay out your case, desire for forgiveness and reconciliation in the relationship. And if that doesn't work, then we are to treat the person like a Gentile or a tax collector. Now, if I'm hearing this instruction, one would think. That would mean that we should totally ignore that person, huh? Even crossing the street when you encounter them in public. But if you looked at Jesus' ministry, Jesus often was reaching out to the tax collectors. Matthew was a tax collector, and he called him to be one of his disciples. And when Jesus gave the commission of the disciples after his resurrection, they would go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them all things Jesus had taught them, they were start in Jerusalem and go to the Gentiles. When Jesus says we are to treat the person like a tax collector or a Gentile, that person is now to become the focus of our prayers and our efforts to bring the gospel to them. Now Peter, he's been listening to this focus upon forgiveness for a um, for, uh, at least 20 minutes an hour that Jesus would talk to And he's starting to understand the importance of forgiveness. But thinking about some times when another person is sitting against him, Peter wonders just how far was he to go with his forgiveness? So Peter asked Jesus, now how many times 
Should I forgive my brother who is, if he sins against me? As many as seven times in one day. And Peter was thinking, you know, seven times in one day is a lot. You know, if I tell a person he or she is sinning against me and I forgave them, about the fourth or fifth time, I'm kind of having some expectation that they're going to change their attitude or their words and actions were. Surely, seven times would be very patient and sufficient. But Jesus, he looks at his best friend, who had one day denied even knowing him three times in the evening, and then abandoned him to face the cross alone, and Jesus, he ups the ante. He said with a tone of authority and seriousness, I tell you not seven times, but seventy times seven. Then Jesus emphasized the point by telling the parable of the king making reconcil make a reckoning of his account. And the king discovers a servant who owes him 10,000 talents. That would be 10,000 years of wages. No way this person can ever pay that. And the king orders the servant his family to all his possessions to be sold and the mom put towards his death. And upon hearing the king's decision, the man drops on his knees begging for mercy. Remarkably, the king forgives the whole debt. Now one would think, having been forgiven such a debt, the servant would be in a joyful, forgiving mood. But just as he leaves the king's presence, he sees a fellow who owes him a hundred denarii, about a hundred days of life. And having been just forgiven 10,000 years of wages, one would think a hundred days of wages, though significant, is nothing in contrast what has been forgiven. The fellow used the same words as he uttered to the king just moments before, asking for mercy. But he said to the servant, as his fellow thrown into prison, and paid to death. But Jesus wants us to put ourselves in that story. Jesus and the Father have forgiven us much more than 10,000 years of wages. We can never repay such a debt. We can never pay the debt of all our sins. How could we possibly repay all the brokenness and suffering that is created, even by a single word of judgment, an act of withholding love, withholding mercy and forgiveness? But the sin ripples through the lives and even through your relationship with God. There is a tearing, a distance in that relationship that we cannot mend with our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus. As the Apostle Paul wrote, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. And we sit in this brokenness of sin and death and suffering. But Jesus is our good shepherd who never leaves us lost in our sin. Jesus laid down his life, bearing each sin, bearing the pain and hurt and brokenness of each one of our sins and the sins of the whole world. And he took it all upon himself as he bore that cross. Jesus bore that cross, suffering for you. For Jesus and the Father could not bear being separated from you, leaving you in that brokenness and pain. Jesus took all your sin, all your brokenness upon himself. We can never repay the Son of God for his suffering and dying for us. And yet Jesus did bear that cross for you. And Jesus declares you. Jesus reconciles you with your heavenly heart. And then Jesus places his Holy Spirit within your heart to bear witness to his love for you. And then Jesus asks you, as an inheritor of his kingdom, as ambassadors of his love, to forgive. To forgive the other 70 times 7 each day. Now how could we possibly do it by ourselves? 7 times in one day, it's kind of easy to keep track. But how could you keep track of 70 times 7? You can't. You aren't supposed to be keeping track. Jesus' love for you is unconditional. Jesus has forgiven you. Jesus, he doesn't take it back after you reach seven or seventy times seven. Jesus has borne the cross for you, and nothing more is needed than Jesus pronouncing you forgiven. And Jesus invites you to abide in his love, to abide in his forgiveness. For Jesus' desire for you is to perceive the other the same way Jesus perceives you, as a person worth his suffering, the cross, and death. And 
only by abiding in Jesus' love and forgiveness, knowing the joy and peace of such forgiveness in our Lord, are we empowered by the Holy Spirit to forgive. And the 70 times 7 in 1 day suggests that it's not just a one and done deal. It is a living into Jesus' love and forgiveness day by day. Day by day, living into that, we're able to forgive, to let go of the sin and hurt. Day by day, abiding in the forgiveness declared unto you by Jesus, abiding in His love and peace with the power of the Holy Spirit. We journey towards forgiving, towards letting go, towards reconciliation. Forgiveness does not mean forgetting, nor does forgiving mean there are consequences. We always remember the hurt. It's like Mary, she remembered each one. Forgiving doesn't always lead to reconciliation. Because sometimes the other doesn't want to be reconciled. But forgiving is letting go of the sin. Letting go of the hurt. Forgiving is unbinding yourself and the other to the sin. Unbinding yourself and the hurt and the brokenness. Jesus always seeks us out in our brokenness and our hurt. Jesus seeks you out and claims you his love, picking you up in his arms. Jesus forgives you. Jesus reconciles you. And then Jesus empowers you to love and to forgive as you are forgiven. Jesus taught that forgiveness is a hallmark characteristic of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus, like a good shepherd, seeks us out when we are lost until he finds us, bringing us into his love. Jesus is the good shepherd who has laid down his life for us, defeating the power of sin and separating us from him and our heavenly father. Jesus seeks you out to love you. And Jesus forgives you that you may know his peace. And as children of the kingdom of heaven, as his ambassadors of love, Jesus invites you to abide in his love so you will live into that journey of loving as you are loved, to forgive as you are forgiven. Jesus, he walks with you in this journey together, a journey in a broken world, where he gives you the peace of his unconditional love and forgiveness as a gift to you and to the other. Amen. Peace of God is past all of you in this day, and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Continue with the song of the day.
Let's arise and confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The prayers of the church today will end. Lord, in your mercy, please respond. Hear our prayer. Drawn together in the compassion of God, we pray for the church, the world, and all those in need. You welcome us when we are weak in faith. Uphold your church throughout the world. Make it a place of welcome. Strengthen faith through Bible studies and Sunday schools, confirmation classes and youth ministries. Nurture new ministries of education and growth. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. The heights of the heavens show us the vastness of your steadfast love. Have compassion on your creation. Where human selfishness has brought ruin and destruction, we look you, look to you to heal, to renew, and redeem your world. And we ask, Lord, that you would help put out the fires in California, in Washington, in Oregon, and help restore uh, that, that which is burned. And we ask, Lord, to continue to provide the right sunshine and rain to bring to a fruition your harvest, so that your creatures and your people may be fed. Lord, in your mercy. Make your ways known to the nations. Speak kindness to our bitter grudges. Settle our hearts when we want to settle accounts with violence. Bless our leaders with patience and wisdom. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Bring healing and justice wherever harm is dealt. Provide vindication for all who are oppressed. Free victims of human trafficking and forced labor. Deliver all who are bound by debt. Feed all who hunger and guard refugees, flee famine and poverty and war. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Teach us to forgive. Remind us that you do not always accuse us. Still our tongues when we are tempted to pass judgment and argue over opinions. Make this congregation a community of mercy for one another and for all our neighbors. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. All these things. And whatever else you see that we need, we entrust to your mercy, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us join together in prayer, Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. Lord look upon you with his favor, and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
those that joined us uh, via uh, live on YouTube. And uh, in a little bit, we're going to be supporting with our offering as we leave. And we ask that you can remember us and continue to support all our congregations, one in Christ. Thank you for your support. Go in peace. Share the good news. Thanks be to God.